Good morning, friends. <laughs> it is currently 6 a.m. and I am getting ready to start a meal prep, a freezer prep, a monthly freezer prep, actually. Um, so today is a busy day. Honestly, this season of life, summertime is a busy time. And I decided that I'm gonna get a meal prep in today. My goal is to be done before lunchtime because I've got other uh, appointments and things I need to take care of this afternoon and I knew that if I skipped my monthly prep that in the next couple of weeks I was really gonna be kicking myself for not doing something because on busy days it's these freezer meals that I can lean into grab out of the freezer and that we can use um, for dinners mostly whenever it comes to actual freezer full meals. So that's what part of what we're working on today. We've got other, I've got a few different things on my list for this morning. And so you're probably wondering what I'm gonna use this pineapple for. <laughs> so we are gonna make up some pineapple chicken meals. Lately I have felt like about two meals of the same meal is about what we enjoy without getting sick of it. Sometimes I do three. So this meal I'm gonna be doing two of, and basically it's more of a crock pot meal setup. So we'll see how that goes. Our family's not over the moon about crock pot meals a lot of the time, but I probably could also make it in the skillet. And we are going to then make rice with it. It's sort of an Asian inspired dish. I say that very lightly because I don't necessarily, I don't know. I guess there are Asian restaurants where you can order pineapple chicken, but um, besides the soy sauce in this, I'm not exactly sure if it's Asian inspired or not. You guys can let me know in the comments if you know more than I do about it. So each recipe needs about one cup of diced pineapple. And I'm actually gonna make these pretty small because we will be making this and then putting it over rice. So something where you know you can get it on a spoon or a fork that's easy to eat along with the chicken. The sun is just starting to peek out. As you can see, it's pretty um, morning-esque in here. <laughs> I have had some coffee. I'm gonna need some more for sure. I definitely don't usually get um, started with filming this early in the morning, but we're gonna chug through and I wanted to film it because wanted to inspire those of you that work and maybe you can squeeze in an early morning prep yourself and feel inspired by this. Okay, our next ingredient that we're going to be chopping up to put in is some red bell pepper. Again, I'm gonna cut this pretty small with the thought of trying to really spread it through the entire recipe. And then this recipe calls for around a pound of chicken per recipe. So since we're doubling it, I have, it's actually about two and a half pounds of chicken here, but it's two breasts per um, recipe. And what I'm going to do is actually make uh, the meat marinade or the sauce that goes with it, about lost that. Um, I'm going to do it twice. Sometimes I put it all together in one big bowl. And then other times like this, I try and mix them up individually the recipes even though it's the same recipe simply because then I know each recipe is getting the amount of sauce and ingredients that it's supposed to have so I just feel a little better about doing it that way with this one but I don't always sometimes I just mix it up in a big bowl and that, that works out well so I'm just going to slice or I mean dice very small dices of the red bell pepper so that it gets mixed in well and as usual, the recipes, I try to say this in every video, I think most people know, but the recipes will be linked in the description box um, for everything that I'm making that I can give you a recipe for. Sometimes I make things in videos, or I should say in almost every video, there's probably something somewhere that is not linked below because it's just something I'm showing you how I'm doing it. Um, if you are a regular cook in the kitchen, you know that not everything has a recipe and not everything is written down. <laughs> Hence why we make videos on how we do things, right guys? So 
Um, yeah, so there's lots of little nuggets and tips and ways that I cook things that I definitely just share in videos and they're not linked below. Okay, so we're getting the bell pepper. I love red bell pepper. It's my favorite for sure. And it is just so delicious. It's so great roasted. I've actually, if I can remember, I'll see if I can find the video where I roasted and canned red bell pepper. You can actually buy that in the store. You can buy jars of canned roasted red bell peppers for on um, paninis and sandwich melts and things like that. And so last year I decided I can do this myself and put in, you know, the, the type of salt I want to use. I can kind of make my own um, mixture up of the way I want the red bell peppers. So did that and we have used them. In fact, the other day we made turkey melts and I think we're down to like one more jar. So that might need to be a project I tackle yet before the harvest season is over. We will see, <laughs> but there's just so, so many ways you can use red bell pepper. I am just about finished um, dicing up the chicken. And again, I'm doing it fairly small, just so that it's all bite sized. And then we're gonna pull out all of the ingredients for the sauce. And what I'm going to do is just have the two bags dump, you know, the measurements in one, dump it in the other so I don't have to get the ingredients out twice. And we will just divvy it out that way. Okay, so as I was <laughs> getting ready, sanitizing things and checking my recipe, I realized that there's a typo in the recipe. So we're gonna do a little bit of guesswork here. Um, for some reason, there's two entries of sesame seed oil. One of them I believe is wrong. It says two teaspoons, um, or like in separate areas on the recipe, you'll see it if you go onto the link. Um, there is, a third cup of sesame seed oil and two teaspoons of sesame seed oil. I've cooked with it enough to know that it is pretty flavorful, so I don't think it's a third cup of sesame seed oil. That just seems like fairly excessive. I just put a fourth cup of brown sugar in both of these. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and add some other things in that third cup that I think is correct. Before we get to that though, I'm gonna put in my um, soy sauce and instead of soy sauce I like to use coconut aminos they are taste better than soy sauce in my opinion and it would be a soy free alternative so we did a fourth cup of the brown sugar and now we're doing a fourth cup of soy sauce or alternative whatever you like to use Ooh, <laughs> that just went everywhere all right um, and then what I'm gonna do before I put my pineapple and red pepper in is actually kind of use my hands to smash this around really well to make sure that the chicken is well coated in the sauce. Okay, so here's where we're kind of improvising, uh, coming up with something instead of a third cup of sesame oil. So I'm doing half of the third cup with avocado oil and the other half I'm gonna put rice vinegar and then we're going to put a few teaspoons of sesame oil in as well. I just don't think, I mean, unless, unless I'm reading something wrong in the recipe, I really don't think it's a third cup of sesame oil. I feel like that would be way too much. Be very overpowering with sesame oil. So we're gonna try this. Um, I think the rice vinegar is gonna add a nice touch. We love rice vinegar and it goes so well in dishes like this. Whoa almost overflowed still might dump some drips <laughs> the silence okay all right now that's all in and i'm just simply going to take my sesame oil uh container dispenser and i'm just going to put in about what i probably would in a pan um, if i was frying this chicken 
And then we are going to add a bit of salt, just a bit, because we've got that soy sauce in there and that is salty. And we have one more ingredient. I gotta grab it out of the freezer. I'm gonna add in some minced garlic as well. And as you guys know, I love making these little cubes. You're gonna want about a teaspoon. We like garlic, so even if it's a little extra, I'm putting about three of these cubes in. Um, it'll be just fine. Throw this back in the freezer. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of massage the brown sugar and the other goodies around in the bottom of here. I've got oil everywhere. Somehow we have an oil <laughs> spill. And I don't know about you guys, but paper towels is one of the best things to soak up oily stuff. I don't think any of this is leaking from the bags. I think it's just from all of my explosion. Okay, all right, so we'll get this kind of a mix around in the bottom. I really like to see how saucy this is. Sometimes recipes like this um, end up a little dry and not saucy enough, and I think this is gonna be absolutely perfect. Super happy with this. Okay, so I'm gonna lay our bags like this because as you guys know, I like to make a pretty freezer meal bag so that whenever I see it in the freezer, I'm like, ooh, that looks good. Inspires me to cook it. Okay, so we're gonna open up our bags here. And now I have a cup measure here and we're gonna put like roughly a cup of pineapple right in there. And then, oops, careful not to touch the inside of the bag since we've got raw chicken in here and I want to use this pineapple leftover for breakfast for the girls. Okay, so we've got the pineapple, trying not to lose any of my juices. And now we're gonna add in our red pepper. Spreading the pineapple out so it all freezes nice and flat. So basically in the recipe she just says to cut up an entire bell pepper and add that into what you got going on. So I'm just dividing these two red bell peppers that I cut up between this. And then I can label everything. My sauce keeps wanting to drizzle out the front. I keep trying to angle the <laughs> the opening of the bag. Okay, so we're almost there with the red bell pepper. Oh, it smells so good. So, so good, the bell pepper. So fragrant. Okay, so we've got a couple little guys there. Okay, so now I'm just going to close these up and squeeze as much air out of them as I can once I've got them down here. Oh, this is, looks so delicious. I'm really excited to have this. I hope I can squeeze it into a day of meals or what I eat in a day in the next little bit so that I can share with you all if we liked it or not. I mean, I'm sure if we like it a lot, you're gonna see a repeat of me making it. I'm almost positive we're gonna love it because it smells so good. <laughs> all right, now these are ready to be labeled and thrown in the freezer. All right, friends, we've had a refill of coffee this morning and I went out and started the grill. We're gonna take this chicken out along with, guess what? <laughs> Buttery steakhouse seasoning. If you watch often, you know I use this literally almost daily. My favorite seasoning has been for the last year at least. Um, I use it a lot of times on veggies, but it's also a neutral style seasoning to where you can use it as a dry rub on a meat that you're gonna use in another recipe, if that makes sense. Okay, so we are getting ready to make some baked Alfredo. And our family is not super gung-ho about lasagna. And I may make some this fall. It's more of like a winter type dish. It's not like we never eat lasagna, but we definitely pick Alfredo over lasagna any day. So this is kind of my version of a frozen pasta dish that we enjoy. I have all of my pasta in this dish here because I buy a lot of my stuff in bulk and I needed to weigh it out for the recipe and we are doubling the recipe. I'm gonna talk real quick about these pans. I have lids here 
and I may actually need to grab a third one because they not, are not a true nine by 13 and I think that's what this recipe is for. So with doubling it, we may end up with three pans this size um, of the baked Alfredo. These pans are awesome if you're getting into uh, freezer meal preps and you don't wanna continuously buy like the disposable pans, you want something you can wash and reuse. These are really great. They're on Amazon, um, there's, they come in packs of four I believe, last I checked and um, they are just excellent to be able to make big batch meals. I think I have 12 of them myself and I'm able to just load them up and reuse them. Obviously, depending on the size of your family, you might want a bigger pan than this, but it's a very budget friendly, reusable pan. They're a good price on Amazon. Okay, so I've got the water going back here for the pasta. Um, it's not quite to a boil and I'm going to shred up some cheese here and then we're gonna run the chicken down to the grill because it's probably about hot enough. It was preheating. So what we have here is some mozzarella and I also have some Parmesan and I'm just going to go ahead and use my food processor here because it's just gonna take a whole lot less time. And to be honest, with this recipe, you use a good amount of parm and um, it's a little bit hard to grate a lot of parm because it's a hard cheese. If you're hand grating, it can be a little hard. So while that's all happening, we're gonna get this um, shredded up real quick and then we'll pop out to the grill. Okay, our pasta is done cooking at this point and I am just adding it back into the pot I boiled it in. I'm going to add just a few tablespoons of butter to this and then we're gonna start making the sauce. I just don't want my noodles to stick together and I need six tablespoons of butter for the sauce. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a little bit of olive oil in here too stir the noodles around so that they don't get into one big clump. I didn't mention this earlier, but these are gluten-free noodles. They're actually made out of chickpeas and we are a gluten-sensitive household. I do make recipes with flour in them as well, um, but whenever I can make it gluten-free, I definitely do. So that is what is in here. Just stirring the oil around so that, and the butter, Letting it, <laughs> sorry if you hear a noise. Our puppy dog is scratching herself on the floor um, so that they don't stick together. All right, so that should be good. We're gonna put the lid on this and we're going to start in to our sauce here. I'm going to start the skillet and I'm gonna put six, again, this is a doubling of the sauce recipe. Going to put six tablespoons of butter into the pan and get it um, melting. We're gonna get some of that frozen garlic out to add in. We're gonna make kind of a garlic butter first in the pan, and then we will add some gluten-free flour. I need to go and double check the chicken 
and probably flip them over. All right, adding in the garlic and I'm going to start whisking and getting the garlic to thaw out since it's a little frozen. Okay, so our garlic is very fragrant and ready to go. It's almost getting brown, which I need to hurry up. Okay, so since we're doubling the recipe, we're gonna put about four tablespoons of flour. I find that I generally need to put a little bit more with using gluten-free flour. This recipe is not calling for gluten-free flour. Um, that's just what I'm doing with the recipe. So I'm going to whisk it in, and sometimes it can feel like it's getting really clumpy, but you just keep right on whisking. I'm gonna add just a little tiny bit more here as I go. And then we're gonna add our milk in. So this recipe calls for a combination of milk and cream. And I've made this before and this has really become my staple Alfredo sauce recipe. Don't be getting store-bought Alfredo. No, I'm only kidding. You can, you can, you can. <laughs> I've done it in busy seasons, but it is so simple to make a homemade Alfredo sauce and it is 10 times better than anything you can buy in the store. My family definitely prefers that. And you just wanna keep on whisking. So I'm adding in the cream first and then I'm going to be adding in the milk as well. And we're gonna also be whisking in the cheese. So I'm just gonna let the cream combine with the flour. Okay, as you're whisking, and that's with the cream, you're gonna start getting more of a saucy consistency. Now I'm adding in the milk, just giving it time to thicken up. And then the cheese is also going to add in another thick thickness element. And you just wanna keep on whisking, even if it looks a little lumpy. In case you've never made an Alfredo sauce, it's so easy. Gravy is made very similarly to this. Um, you're just gonna use broth instead of so much milk. All right, and this is why I'm gonna combine all of this in my big stock pot that I made the pasta in because I knew doubling up this sauce recipe that I would not get very far in this pan. All right, so we're just gonna Keep on whisking. We're gonna let this kind of heat up again till it starts to feel a little thick again. And then we'll add in the cheese. Okay, I'm gonna add in all of the parm. And I've let the milk heat up pretty well as well. And then about half of the mozzarella um, because the other half we're gonna top off our dishes with. So. And I like to, since, since I shred my own cheese and I have the option to shred it how I would like it for the recipe, I like to shred it very fine like this because then um, it melts a lot more evenly and quickly. Woo! <laughs> um, because it's so small. So it works out perfectly. So I'm just gonna let this heat and let the cheese heat and just keep on whisking. Ooh, look at that. Look how fast that already is giving us a great melt. So I'm also going to add, whoa, there we go. I do this like every time I make a huge sauce <laughs> in the skillet. Okay, I'm also gonna add some salt extra salt just to taste and keeping in mind there's that parm in there and that's a salty cheese and then also some black pepper we love black pepper in our house my mom cooked with it a lot I think I've said that before so I always put it in my recipes okay trying to whisk as gingerly as possible so we don't have another spill okay so I'm just gonna let this heat until it seems to be a little bit thicker than this and then we will dump it in with the noodles we're gonna work on chopping up our chicken while this is heating all right so I've started in on some of the chicken and my husband was through here and was 
getting pieces of chicken this morning because it smells so good in the house. And I think it's interesting how every recipe has its own measurements. So some recipes will say use two pounds of chicken or um, ounces or <laughs> whatever. So this one is actually gives you a cup measurement for diced cooked chicken. So we like ours more in like little strips. So that's how I'm cutting it in our Alfredo. And I have about three cups, I believe here. So I'm just giving it bite-sized pieces. And our sweet little Zaley dog, she's down here waiting for me to give her something. She just knows it smells good in here. <laughs> and I think my husband may have given her a little piece of this chicken. Um, so I'm just gonna finish cutting the strips of chicken so that when we're ready to dump the sauce into the pasta, we've got the chicken in there too. And I'm really thinking it's gonna make three pans. This looks like a lot of food, which is great. That means one more freezer meal that I wasn't really thinking would happen in today's prep is going to be added to the pile. Here we go with the sauce. And I'm going to grab my whisk. Can't leave any of that behind with this, especially because sometimes some of the cheese sort of sinks to the bottom of the skillet. All right, and in with the grilled chicken. You can add broccoli to this too, but we like to make our veggies on the side with this. So all I'm doing is stirring it all together, perfect amounts, everything looks fantastic, smells absolutely delicious. And I'm going to put, these, put this into the pans and then see if it makes two or three. I can, it's really hard for me to tell. I feel like it's two and a half, so I'll probably try to pile all of it into the two pans I brought up. I have both pans sitting on a hot pad just because I know it's going to get really hot <laughs> really fast. So I have some avocado oil spray, just spraying these down so that when I go to bake them, um, it doesn't stick so, so bad. Okay, and we're gonna start scooping the Alfredo in. And maybe the other idea I had is if I have a little bit left over and it's not enough for a whole pan, I might just pop the rest into the refrigerator and then somebody can have it for lunch over the next couple of days. Grilled chicken just makes Alfredo. It's just so good that way. I've made it with shredded chicken before and definitely not, not our fave to do it that way, so. I've committed to making it with grilled chicken always. <laughs>
All right, so I told my husband what I was about to start prepping, and that is some sausage gravy, and he said, ooh, I could eat that for breakfast. So we're gonna go ahead and whip up some biscuits for biscuits and gravy, and then we're gonna make our bulk amount of sausage gravy for the freezer. I found a great recipe online to do freezer sausage gravy, and I'm excited because this is something that we really enjoy. It's just something that takes a little extra time in the morning to make. And so because mornings tend to be a little hectic, I don't often get it done. So having the conveniency of the sausage gravy in bags in the freezer will make it a whole lot easier to make up sausage gravy with biscuits or on top of eggs or whatever we want to use it for. So since we have a request to eat this for breakfast and the girls will enjoy this too, I'm actually going to whip up these biscuits and then whatever's left over, I'm going to freeze them and test the idea of freezing the biscuits along with the sausage gravy and see if this is a good recipe to freeze. So we are making a gluten-free version of biscuits. You don't have to do that. The, everything that I, or for the most part, unless I make note of it, most of the things I make that are gluten-free, you can actually make with regular flour. So just like the Alfredo I just showed you and the sausage gravy that we'll be making as well. So I have one and three fourth cup of all-purpose gluten-free flour in here. And then I'm also going to put about a fourth cup of cornstarch. And this is all to help make the biscuits extra flaky, all that good stuff. So we are going to go ahead and just whisk together our dry ingredients here as we go. We need a tablespoon of baking powder and then we're gonna do half a teaspoon. I think it's half, I need to double check my recipe here. Nope, I was wrong. It's a fourth teaspoon of baking soda and a half teaspoon of salt. So. I'm gonna grab my salt up on the shelf here. And if you don't have a pastry cutter, which is what I am going to use to make this, which is a great kitchen investment, by the way, I use it in many different ways. That's this thing right here. You can go ahead and grate your butter instead of using a pastry cutter. You're gonna get a very similar um, experience, a similar result. We're also gonna add in two teaspoons of sugar, and I just have cane sugar here, so that's what we're gonna be using. And whisk that in as well. Now we're ready for the butter, and I have it cut already. There's eight tablespoons of butter. Cut it just like this, and I'm just gonna dump it in here, and this is cold butter. You do not wanna be working with warm butter because you want to be able to cut it in to your flour, like so. And I'm using a nice round bowl so I can go around the bowl and continue to cut, hopefully you can see well, continue to cut the butter into the flour until it's crumbly and well combined. In case you've never seen anyone make biscuits or you've never made them from scratch yourself, the whole reason that biscuits are flaky is this right here. So what happens is cutting the butter into the flour takes tiny pieces of butter and coats them in flour and allows the butter to sort of stay in pockets inside of the biscuit. So it creates a very flaky effect and it makes it really, really a delicious, yummy texture, that texture that we know in biscuits. So can't skip this step or soften your butter and mix it in. You're not gonna get the same result. The last ingredient that goes in here is buttermilk. And I cheat a little bit. I've talked about this in the past. It's been a while since I've said anything about it. But I keep buttermilk powder in a jar in the back of my refrigerator. And then when I have a recipe <laughs> that needs buttermilk, I can easily whip some up. So this morning with the request of biscuits, 
Um, I definitely would not have been able to make this recipe if I didn't have that because it's not something I use super often. So there's a little kitchen hack for you. Get some buttermilk powder. So I just, um, a little while ago, mixed this up with cold water and I put it back in the refrigerator to get it all nice and cold. And you want this to stay cold because otherwise your butter is gonna melt, like I said. So you want everything you're adding in here to be cold. So we have a cup of buttermilk. I'm gonna take my spoon and just kind of um, stir it together as little as possible, just making kind of a sticky batter. This is usually how, oh, I can smell it. It smells like biscuits. <laughs> the buttermilk and the butter. It's just that signature biscuit smell for sure. So as you can see, I'm just kind of combining it as quickly as I can. My oven is almost preheated back here. I started that before I started the recipe because again, you want to go from cold to the oven with this and just kind of cutting in the rest of the flour here with my spoon and making sure that all of the pockets of liquid are combined. Looking at pretty good. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take some parchment paper, put it onto the cookie sheet so we don't have anything sticking or burning. And then this recipe is for about 10 biscuits. So that tells me about what I want to divide everything into. And these are drop biscuits, so we're not gonna be cutting them out. They're just going to be um, formed. You can form them with your hand. You can do um, it with a spoon, a scooper, whatever you prefer. I just know my sizing will be pretty close if I know that I'm supposed to be getting 10 biscuits out of this. And I'm trying not to touch them a whole lot, like really get them formed and then on here because it, again, will melt the butter. <laughs> Don't want that to melt until it's in the oven. All right, I got nine biscuits form, formed here. We're gonna call that good. I don't currently have a brush or else I would brush this across here, but we are just gonna top it with some butter on each biscuit and then we'll pop these in the oven. These don't take long to bake, so they'll definitely be done before our sausage gravy's ready, but that's okay. I just thought I'll get these put in. That way, as soon as the gravy's ready, we can pour it right over top of them and get these nice and golden brown. That's what this butter helps out with. It makes the tops of the biscuits very nice and brown. To make the sausage gravy, I'm just using this regular sausage. I'm gonna do it in two batches. Um, this is two pounds and this is two pounds. That way, as you saw, my skillet doesn't overflow. So we're gonna get that put in to the skillet one at a time and fried up. I just pulled the biscuits out. They don't take long at all to bake. Our sausage is almost finished frying here, or at least for the first batch. Then we're gonna remove the sausage and we'll make the gravy and add the sausage back in once the gravy is made in the pan. Now, whenever you take the sausage out of here, you're gonna leave the drippings in the bottom of the skillet because that's part of what brings the flavor to sausage gravy. 
You can even leave any little bits and pieces that are in the bottom too if you want to. Obviously, it's all going to get combined in the end. It's just easier to whisk the gravy when you don't have all the sausage sitting in there. All right, so now we're going to add six tablespoons of butter, kind of similar to what we just did with the Alfredo sauce. And we're gonna let that melt in there like so. It's not gonna take long with the pan being hot already. You cut your butter up, it helps to thaw it out even faster. We are gonna be adding a half cup of flour to this. And if you are using gluten-free flour like I'm using, this recipe is not for gluten-free flour, but if you are, you may end up needing a bit more. So just keep that in mind. We're gonna be adding six cups in total of whole milk, but I'm going to get two cups sitting here ready to help me out if I um, end up with some really thick stuff here. And again, you're just gonna whisk that flour. It's gonna make a paste and it's gonna look all clumpy and you might start freaking out, but don't worry. <laughs> I promise it'll come together. It's gonna look great when you're done. So you just kind of have this thick pasty stuff going on. And then you're gonna add in milk slowly. I actually need to turn my burner down. I just realized that it was up a little higher to make the sausage. So you're gonna get this clumpy pasty looking stuff and just keep on going, keep on whisking. Scrape those little bits of sausage off the bottom. So we've got four more cups of milk to go in this. And because I am using the gluten-free flour, I'm gonna keep an eye on this um, because I'm not sure if I need to add a tiny bit more flour or not, we'll see but you wanna just keep on going until you stop seeing such lumpiness. <laughs> Another thing you can do if you're using gluten-free flour and you're not used to it and you don't haven't done a lot of cooking with gluten-free stuff is add a little bit of cornstarch into the mixture too if you feel like it's not getting thick enough for you. So, and it's starting to thicken up again. I'm gonna get some more milk. One reason I don't like to add too much milk at once is because then you can't see the little lumps as well. <laughs> if you're needing to whisk them out a little bit better, you can't see them quite as good if you've got too much milk going on at once. And some of this is bits and pieces of sausage that were in here too. But just wanna make sure we're getting all of those little lumps out. All right, so we've got two more cups of milk. I'm honestly saying it out loud because then I don't forget <laughs> how many cups I am in. And I'm gonna let that thicken just a bit more before I put the rest of the milk in. I'm gonna bring the heat up just a bit and whisk it as I go. All right, now we're just gonna add the sausage back in and everybody can eat their brunch out of this batch and then I'm gonna make up the second batch as well. But this is a large family recipe, so there's gonna be a couple meals worth out of it for our family. And oh, it looks so good. I've been eating little pieces of sausage. So delicious. And I'm gonna let this simmer just a little bit more. Stir the sausage in well. Had to grab a spoon. Yes, that looks so good. So, so good. Any sausage gravy pros out there can tell me if I did good or bad. <laughs> and just like anything else when it comes to heating something with dairy, um, we had a little chat about this uh, a few weeks ago but you wanna make sure when you take it out of the freezer that you thaw it out slowly and that you heat it slowly so that your milk does not separate or has a very um, low chance of separating. Doesn't mean it won't, not 
bulletproof, but if you do it all low and slow, it will reheat back to a consistency like this. All right, we are sailing right along. We've got a lot going on. I pulled out the air fryer over here. We've got bacon being made in that for another recipe we're gonna tackle here soon. I am cooking up some sprouted oatmeal and this is gonna go for some frozen oatmeal cups. I've made these before. We're gonna make about six cups of oatmeal. And then I'm going to do half and half uh, water and almond milk in with the oatmeal. And then I also have my second batch of the sausage gravy being made over here. I'm frying up the sausage for that. And my husband and everybody, I, I test tasted it as well. So good. Those biscuits are just delicious. I'm definitely saving that recipe whether they freeze well or not just because they're so fast and easy to make. So definitely a good one to do with gluten-free flour. And it turns out so flaky and very, very delicious, good flavor. So same process, I'll fry this up, remove it, and then make the gravy. And we're gonna put our liquid in here with our oatmeal. To this oatmeal mixture, I'm going to add in some liquid stevia just to sweeten it up a bit and we can add in even more later, but just adding, kind of making a base and then we can add other flavors to it. And then I'm also going to add some cinnamon into this too. Again, just as a very like basic oatmeal to add more to later. And I will just keep an eye on this and stir it as it cooks. I'm wrapping up the second batch of the sausage gravy. It's ready for the sausage to go back in. I've gotten out my stand mixer here because we are going to whip up some baked or sheet pan omelets. That's what the bacon is for. I have my oatmeal slowly cooking back here. I've kind of been checking on it and stirring it as I go. And then this is the first batch of the sausage gravy, what we didn't eat for brunch. And I'm just letting it cool because everything has to be cooled before you put it in the freezer for best results. All right, so I'm just gonna stir this in and then we'll let this simmer just a little bit more yet with the sausage in it, let the flavors combine well. And then I'm going to use this to mix up my base for the baked omelet and then we'll put the bacon and the other toppings on top. I need to get out some peppers and onions as well. So we're doing bacon, peppers and onions and cheddar cheese. But if you guys remember my base for my baked omelets is usually eggs and sour cream. And I may add just a little bit of milk in here as well. If I recall the last time I made them, I think I did 20 eggs per sheet, something like that. I might have to go back in my video and look <laughs> and see how many I did. So I may need to pull out a few more eggs than this to do two full sheets. But the story behind all of the bacon I have here is last year, I had found a super, super great deal at a bulk food store on peppered bacon. So this bacon on the outside has kind of like a black peppered crust and it's so delicious. My husband and I really love it, but our children didn't like it very much. So we went through it very slowly this past year and this is the last of it. There was two packs left um, and it's the last of the pepper bacon, which is fine with me. These will probably be eaten mostly by me, but they also, the girls may eat it because it's gonna be in an omelet form and not just eating the bacon on its own. Just a little bit was a little spicy for them. Um, but they also, I've noticed, we're gonna pull this off the heat here, let it cool a little bit back there before I 
put it in the big bowl to cool down. Um, but I've also noticed that in the last couple of months, our oldest has started to like buffalo wing sauce and some other spicy things like jalapenos. So maybe she will enjoy this as well. But I thought it would be a good way to use them up and to make more convenient breakfasts. Um, we love having the baked omelets. And if you don't watch all of my videos, I do have videos where I show what we eat in a day or a day of meals. And I've shown how we take those baked omelets and we actually put them in the air fryer to heat them up and they reheat very nicely that way. Okay, I had to pull up my last video that I made with um, making sheet pan omelets and I actually didn't do a bacon or sausage in that. So I did 30 eggs. So for this one, I'm doing like 24, 25 eggs um, since I'm gonna be adding bacon to it as well. And I'm just kind of scooping I'm gonna actually finish this container. I'm not really measuring the amount of sour cream. And then I'm also gonna add a splash of just heavy cream in here as well, along with some salt and pepper. Just a nice little base that um, we can add other things to. And I was actually not sure if I even have quite enough eggs to do two pans. So I'm gonna check my other pan here. I mean, check my refrigerator, good grief. <laughs> check my refrigerator and see how many more eggs I have. All right, I found enough eggs <laughs> in the refrigerator to do the second pan. And I have my oven preheated, so I'm just waiting to get all of this topped off here. Putting the eggs in first. The oatmeal is done. So I'm just letting that sit for a minute. So you know, sometimes it's the simplest ideas that win. <laughs> and this is one that every time I make it, the girls just love it. In fact, they are getting ready. Um, my husband had off work today. They're getting ready to go to the pool and just walked out the door, saw what I was making and said, oh mom, when we get back, we wanna eat those. <laughs> so all this is, is a bit more of a whole food take on the packets of instant oatmeal. I've made them before on my channel, so if you guys have watched for a long time, you know what I'm about to do. And basically all I do 
is take some big muffin tins like these and then I have these little papers that make things a bit easier. I've done it, I think, without the papers as well. Um, it's just easier to manage them a little bit if we've got something to hold the oatmeal with. So all I'm gonna do is take the oatmeal, fill up, I might need a smaller spoon. Yeah, I think it might be a bit more manageable with a smaller spoon. I'm gonna grab something smaller got something that I'm not gonna make a big mess with. So I'm just gonna fill up the muffin cup and then I'm just going to take either, I have blueberries and strawberries here. I think I've done this with raspberries as well. I'm just gonna take a nice handful of fruit or slice up some strawberries and just press it in to the top of the oatmeal. And then we're gonna freeze these like this. So I'm gonna do a batch freeze them, I'll see how much I have left in here. Once they're completely frozen, I'll put them into a freezer bag and then they can just take portions out little at a time. So you can do these in the microwave. Um, I've also taken the wrapping on the off of the outside and put them into a stove top. It just cuts down like on a teeny, 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 tiny bit of time <laughs> that it takes to cook up oatmeal and actually it really saves time whenever you're doing steel cut oats or sprouted oats. These are sprouted um, because these do take longer to cook. So they're not as fast as like an instant oatmeal. Plus you're not getting dried fruit, you're getting fresh fruit with this. And you can decide what sweeteners and other add-ins you might wanna put into the oatmeal versus the oatmeal packets. Again, I know this is an incredibly, incredibly simple idea. It's nothing like new or revolutionary, but it is like the first thing that gets eaten out of our freezer. The girls just love them, and actually I do too. They're just an easy, quick way. You can even have them as snacks in the evening. Um, they don't necessarily have to be a breakfast thing, and it just simply takes making a nice big pot of oatmeal <laughs> and doing them up. I'm getting everything labeled and ready to go into the freezer, but it's been a successful day. I finished cooking a little bit after 12 o'clock afternoon, and I got so much done in a morning meal prep session, freezer meal prep session, which is awesome. I'm so excited to have all of this on hand for this coming month, and I know that it's going to be so convenient to grab and go on busy days. So if you guys are new here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment below, give this video a like, and I'll see you in my next video.